is the last talk, but before giving Maria del Mar, first of all, gives the talk, uh, I think she's going to receive the award. Yeah, you should come. Because she has been awarded the 2015 Young Investigation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is an honor for me to receive this prize, and I would also like to thank the organization for allowing me to present my work in this conference. And today I would like to present to you uh, a work that is entitled A Role for Calidin 7 in Corticostriatal Synaptic Dysfunction in Huntington's Disease. Just as a brief introduction, uh, HD is an autosomal dominant inherited neurodegenerative disorder with a prevalence around 5-7 cases per 100,000 individuals that was first described in 1872 by George Huntington. A hundred years later, it was identified the locus responsible for HD in the chromosome 4, and 10 years later, it was discovered the genetic mutation for uh, the disease in the first exon of the IT15 gene. Indivi the individuals that are not affected by HD exhibit between 11 and 29 CAG repetitions codifying for the wild type Huntington, while HD patients exhibit more than 40 CAG repetitions codifying for the mutant Huntington. Although neuropathologically, HD is characterized by a massive cell death in the caudet and putamen nucleus, and also cell death and a ring cage of the cerebral cortex, uh, this cell death doesn't appear, doesn't occur until advanced and later stages of the disease, being the brain atrophy and neuronal dysfunction, the primary events that exhibit HD patients. This dysfunction, particularly of the corticostriatal pathway and in the hippocampal circuitry, are the ones responsible for the presence of cognitive and psychiatric dis deficits in HD patients. At later disease stages, this brain atrophy and neuronal dysfunction is accompanied by the neuronal death, particularly in the medium-sized spiny neurons in the caudet and putamen nucleus, that are the ones responsible for the presence of severe motor disturbances in HD patients. So HD is a complex disorder that involves not only severe motor disturbances, but also cognitive and psychiatric deficits. And unfortunately, uh, we have no cure, no treatments available to cure this disorder. So then it's important to understand the molecular mechanisms involved in Huntington's disease, but also to determine the temporal sequence of brain pathology in HD. In HD patients, it has been described that Corticostriatal pathway is several impaired at early disease stages. Also, hippocampal dysfunction is altered more at mild disease stages and later in the disease progression, the neuronal death in the basal ganglia and cerebral cortex and also abnormalities in other brain regions appear. In our work, we focus our attention in the study of the corticostriatal pathway and we took advantage of the genetic mouse models of HD. Particularly, we study in this, in this study, we use the knocking animals in which there is a replacement in the exon one of the mouse Huntington gene with a mutant human exon one. And to validate some of our data, we also use the R61 model. To corroborate some of the studies, we also uh, perform some in vitro approximations using neuronal primary cultures and also post-mortem uh, brain samples from control individuals and HD patients at different grades of affection. So our aim was to study the molecular mechanisms involved in corticostriatal dysfunction in Huntington's disease. And our first question was whether these deficits uh, in corticostriatal pathway were present in our knocking animal. 
And if so, when do they appear in the disease progression and which underlying mechanisms could be involved? To evaluate whether our knocking animal present some corticostriatal deficits, we perform the accelerating rotor rot task that is considered a learning task dependent on the corticostriatal connectivity. Basically, we measure the latency to fall of these animals in the rotor rot, in the accelerating rotor rot over the course of five minutes. What we found is that at early disease stages, at two months of age, really early in the disease progression, knocking animals in these black circles exhibit a delay in the acquisition of the task. And at six months of age, this impairment in the learning of the task was even more robust and clear, being more drastic also at eight months of age, so it was age dependent. Our question here was, these deficits in accelerating rotor rot are due to a motor coordination problems, or we are talking just about learning? And to solve this question, we performed a fixed rotor rot, and we found that neither at two nor at six months of age, knocking animals exhibit any problem in motor coordination. However, at eight months of age, this impairment in the learning of the task was accompanied by an alteration in motor coordination. Later, we asked uh, whether these deficits in the learning of this corticostriatal task were accompanied or not by some alterations in synaptic transmission. And in collaboration with Dr. Eduardo Martin in the University of Castilla-La Mancha, we evaluate synaptic transmission in corticostriatal coronal slices. And what we found is that knocking animals exhibit alter corticostriatal synaptic transmission at early disease stages, also at two, three months of age. To understand whether these learning and synaptic transmission deficits correlate or not with synaptic plasticity alterations, we performed dialistic labeling, and we found that in the motor cortex at early disease stages, knocking animals exhibit a significant, a significant decrease in the dendritic spine density, but no changes were detected when the striatum was evaluated, indicating that there is a decrease in synaptic plasticity in the density of dendritic spines in the motor cortex, but not in the striatum at early disease stages. To corroborate these data, we also performed several immunostaining analyses, and one of the markers that we used was PSD95, that is an excitatory postsynaptic marker. What we found is that in different layers of the motor cortex, knocking animals exhibit a significant decrease in the density of PSD95 immunoreactive puncta. But again, no significant changes were found when the dorsal striatum was analyzed, indicating that the decrease in dendritic spine density was accompanied by a decrease in a specifically excitatory postsynaptic clusters in the motor cortex again, but not in the striatum at early disease stages. The next question was which underlying mechanisms could be involved in this deficit? And to solve or try to solve this question, we evaluate by Western blood the expression levels of different proteins involved in postsynaptic uh, transmission. CAM kinase 2 as a signaling protein involved in synaptic processes, some presynaptic proteins, and also some AMPA and NMDA receptor subunits. Our results revealed a specific decrease in the cerebral cortex of knocking animals at early disease stages of the rogef calerin 7 protein, but no significant changes in the other synaptic-related proteins analyzed were found. We performed the same analysis in the striatal region, and we found no significant differences in the expression levels of all these proteins at these early disease stages. To corroborate that this uh, change in calorin 7 expression was a general hallmark of HD and not because the use of knocking animals, we also use R61 mice and we found that there, is a, that there was a significant decrease in the levels of expression of calorin 7, again at early disease stages in the cerebral cortex without any changes in the striatal region. So what is calorin 7? Calorin 7 is a rush of protein that is expressed specifically in neurons in excitatory 
postsynaptic clusters. And it is particularly interesting because it contains the RACGF domain that is able to activate the small GTPase RAC1 that in turn promotes actin cytoskeleton rearrangements leading to spinal structural and functional plasticity events. It has been described previously that in cultures, the overexpression of calidin 7 promotes the spine formation and maintenance, while calidin 7 knockdown promotes the spinous ring cage and loss. And this work was also supported by in vivo studies using knockout animals, and in these studies they found that the lack of calidin 7 expression decreases the density of dendritic spines in different brain regions involved in cognitive processes such as the hippocampus and the cortex. Because it's drug jeff activity, our next question was whether these deficits in calidin 7 levels were accompanied or not by an alteration in its downstream signaling. So by uh, inhabilitating RAC1 activity. What we found is that by pull-down assay, the decrease in calidin 7 levels was associated with also a reduction in the RAC1 activity knocking animals at early disease stages. So the question was, could the decrease in calidin 7 levels in the cortex of HD models be involved in the early cortical dysfunction in the presence of mutant Huntington? And to solve this question, we uh, moved to an in vitro approximation. We use cortical primary cultures, and we uh, maintain the cultures in vitro during 28 days to facilitate the neuron maturation and the synapse maturation, and we process the neurons for Western blood and immunocytochemistry uh, experiments. We validate our in vitro system, so we found a significant reduction in the calorie 7 levels in R61 neurons in culture, and more importantly and interestingly, this reduction was associated with a significant decrease in the number of excitatory synapses as indicated by a decrease in the colocalization between PSD95 as a postsynaptic excitatory marker and VGLUT1 as a presynaptic marker. So we're wondering to know whether the overexpression of calidin 7 in neuronal cultures from HD embryos could increase the number of excitatory synapses or not. To do that, we transfect our cultures overexpressing calidin 7 levels, and we found that in the wild type condition, the overexpression of calidin 7 promotes a significant increase in the number of excitatory synapses, and more importantly, that the overexpression of calidin 7 increases the number of excitatory synapses in the presence of mutant Huntington. So we propose that in a, control con in a control situation, the proper expression of calorin 7 uh, promotes the proper cortical communication and therefore the proper corticostriatal connectivity, while in HD conditions, the decrease in calorin 7 levels contributes to alter the cortical circuitry that then later could promote the disruption of the corticostriatal connectivity. Our conclusions, therefore, were that cortical dysfunction precedes striatal pathology and mediates early corticostriatal synaptic and cognitive deficits in HD mice, that calorin 7 downregulation in the cortical region of HD mice at early disease stages emerge as key contributors of these cortical alterations, and that calorin 7 overexpression in mature cortical neurons rescues the deficits observed in the number of cortical excitatory synapses. Therefore, we propose that the restoration of cortical dysfunction in HD at early time points is crucial, and we propose as a therapeutic target the modulation of calorin 7 expression. Finally, I would like to thank the, my colleagues uh, in the Department of Biomedicine in the University of Barcelona, and particularly to Dr. Silvia Ginés, who was my PhD supervisor and, of course, uh, supervised also this work. Also to our collaborators in the University of Connecticut and in the University of Castilla-La Mancha. And thank you for your attention and for the prize. We have the right to ask some questions to this nice presentation. Thank you. Any questions? I, 
I think I, I asked you this before in your thesis committee, but uh, assuming that the, the role of Calirin 7 is really acting, acting as a GIF, acting on RAC 1, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is the more um, useful therapeutically to modify the GIF activity or the RAC activity or overexpressing mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the patients? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that first we will need to move to in vivo to try to check whether the overexpression of calorie 7 really promotes a, an amelioration of the cognitive function in these animals. Uh, but I found in specifically interesting the modulation directly of calorie 7 instead of RAC1 because uh, calorie 7 is expressed exclusively in neurons, so I think that this could give us the opportunity to just modulate uh, RAC activity in neurons instead of, for example, in, gli in glial cells. No? So, but of course, we also is one thing is normalize the expression levels of a protein, no? and the other thing is overexpress the protein. So probably we will need to play a bit trying to find the, the, the proper levels of expression. And my question is, what is the relationship between the Huntington, the abnormal Huntington protein and the Calidin 7? Mm -hmm. What is the link? Yes, th there is a link. Uh, and, and I, I didn't include it in this presentation, but it was described several years ago that uh, hunt, not Huntington directly, but Huntington interacting protein is interacting with calorie 7 but no functional effect was found. And indeed, in our work, we didn't go in detail to evaluate how the interaction, that I think that could be really interesting, how the interaction is really modulating maybe the expression levels of, of calorie 7. But I think that it will be a good, a good point also to evaluate. Here. Uh, have you found any effect of this, of this, uh, in these mice of a glucose uptake? Because I believe that HD mice present some glucose deficits in the brain. I mean, in our knocking model, uh, I don't think that we detect and that, that we perform these experiments. No, I think that we never checked this before in our lab. It's because I, I made the question because RAC1 is involved in glucose uptake. Yes. By the way, it is in astrocytes, in cortical astrocytes. So you just said that RAC1 is only present in neurons. We have found it also in astrocytes. So I would be. So, uh huh. No, I really mean, I would interesting. I'm careful to modulate <laughs> RAC1 because. Really interesting, but, but we didn't check it for sure before. And, and to be honest, I never thought about that possibility. But thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, I think the paper is over, and thank you very much to all for the presentations. Thank you.